Interview prep is absolutely important. At least pay for that good resume, at least, because it's your resume. I do not know you at all before I interview you. A lot of these people, I do not know them. Most pilots don't understand what career opportunities are available in the world of aviation. They're making career decisions based on advice from friends or posts on internet forums. Meaning they are taking huge risks with their livelihood without having all the details. This podcast was created to help you understand the aviation industry so you can find your dream job. Let's get ready for pushback. Here's your host and my dad. Nick Fialka. Hey, Pilot. Welcome to another interview episode of Ready for Pushback. I'm Nick Fialka, and today I've got a very special guest, Jimmy Reel from Allegiant. Allegiant is a really awesome company, and if you're a pilot that is considering the world of professional aviation and you really want to be a professional pilot and have a great career, but you're not interested in being gone three or five or seven days in a row, Allegiant could be the company for you because they are a company that focuses on out and backs. Every day you're at your house, chilling with your family, relaxing and doing your thing. They will get into a lot of the details of how they operate. And I hope you really enjoy this episode. And last but not least, let's have a quick word from our sponsors because without them, we wouldn't have this awesome podcast. Hey pilot, it's Nick. I want to tell you about a great friend of the show, Timothy P. Pope. He's a financial planner and he's completely focused on the professional pilot. He's the kind of guy you want to go to for real talk to help you figure out your financial future. With so many upgrades and so many transitions and so many things going on, you owe it to yourself to give him a call. He'll help you design and execute really smart financial planning strategies, whether it's retirement planning, investment management, military transition, tax planning. He's a great financial planning partner, Timothy P. Pope, CFP, helping professional pilots make the most out of life. Give him a shout. All the information's in the show notes. You should definitely tell him I told you to call. All right. Here we are today with Jimmy Reel from Allegiant Airlines. Jimmy's an FO down in Fort Lauderdale. He's also one of the lead recruiters. He works in pilot hiring and he's also a pilot mentor once you get there. And we're going to have a really cool discussion. Jimmy, welcome, my man. Hey, thanks a lot, Nick. Thanks for having me. This is going to be super fun. So why don't you tell the pilot at home just a little bit about yourself? All right. Well, thanks, Nick. I appreciate that. Just your regular average guy, I guess. About 48 years old. I got married, five kids, live in South Florida. I retired from the Army after 23 years. During that time, I lived in Korea, Germany, deployed twice to the former Soviet Republic of Georgia, once to Macedonia and Kosovo, and then also to Iraq, and then did three tours in Afghanistan before I decided to hang it up in 2018 and see what this whole airline business was all about. So once I retired from the Army, just like anybody else, a lot of the other Army helicopter pilots out there, I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. I was kind of sitting back and, well, maybe I'll go fly EMS, maybe do some of this long line, that sort of thing, or for the power companies or whatever. But a lot of the people, our tag at the time, Rotary Transition to Airline Group, was just taking root at the time. And a lot of the airlines were offering a Rotary Transition program. And that was basically, you could take a guy with no fixed wing time at all and get him his private pilot license, his commercial multi-engine, his instrument ticket, send him off to do 250 hours fixed wing PIC time building, send him to ATP, CTP, and then roll him right into the new hire class. So that's what I did at one of the regionals. After doing all that training, it took about five months from the time I got there to the time I checked out. And then afterwards, I got to that first airline and I got to Sims and I just fell apart, man. It was completely, it was earth shattering. I was completely out of my element altogether. And like many other helicopter pilots during that time, we were told to pack our bags and go home. And so at this point, seven months of training, 
And I think it's kind of down the drain at this point. You know what I mean? But I talked to a number of people and talked to my wife, my brother-in-law who flies for Delta, and they convinced me to give it another try. So I picked up the phone and I contacted Mace Airlines. It was basically flying the same airplane that I'd kind of been trained in at this point. And then I contacted Mesa. It was, it was the best decision I ever made at this point. Got through training just fine, no problems, and went, uh, was Dallas based. So then commuting was, it was a thing from South Florida to Dallas. Basically, one of those things where you had to either show up the day before or you missed the last flight or both. And a lot of times for maybe your viewers that haven't been in the 121 world, if you do not live in base and you have a show time, that is say, I don't know, it says before like nine in the morning and you have a three hour flight. Well, that kind of limits it down to only one flight, probably that you're going to be able to make it. Most of the time that one flight's full. You're right though. Commuting is really difficult. And so you flew at Mesa and then when did you get hired by Allegiant? I got hired by Allegiant in November of 2021, and I started in December of 2021, about two weeks after I was hired. Man, that's awesome. It's a quick move. Yes. And so I guess what I was going to kind of let you know about, basically, when you commute, oftentimes you lose a lot of time. If you just take your straight checkerboard airline schedule, it's going to be four four four-day trips. You can mix and match and whatnot, but... If you just think of four four day trips, that leaves about two to three days off between. So if you have to commute the day before, you got to buy that hotel and you got to buy all those meals and you're off for four days, you're off on your trip for four days. And then if you miss that last flight home, you're buying another hotel. And I thought of myself as a Dallas resident. I live in South Florida. I mean, for those two years. And I love Mesa. I really, really love my experience there. But that commute was, I mean, it was terrible. It really was for me. Yeah. So I was really happy when I got hired at Allegiant, the opportunity to live in base and just fly an Airbus one trip out, one trip back, and then get in your car and drive home. Yeah. And that's an important segue, right? And so I talked to a lot of people about the airlines. Everybody has different understandings of what it is. And this is what is most interesting about Allegiant, right? Is it's day trips and it's living in your base. Can you talk to me a little bit? If somebody doesn't know about the Allegiant model, can you explain it for them? It's for a lot of traditional airline pilots, it's a tough concept to wrap your head around. But this is what happens is that if I'm a line holder, I normally bid reserve because I live about an hour away from the airport. So I enjoy the time on reserve so that I can do a lot of my recruiting and hiring and stuff like that from the comfort of my home. But if I'm just a straight line pilot, I have a show time, which is about an hour before takeoff. That You drive in, go through security, you go to your gate, you fly your leg out, and maybe you fly the leg out or the captain flies the leg out, and then you fly the leg back. And afterwards, you say goodbye and you get in your car and you drive home. Is it typically one leg per day or is it sometimes two or three? Well, it can never be three, but (laughs) so... I mean, are you doing four, I guess, even numbers? It's even numbers unless there's a random overnight or something like that. I've only had... I've been on the line for about a year and I've only had three overnight, three times away from my bed since I've been here. Were those planned overnights or were those like maintenance or how did that end up? So (laughs) I'm glad you brought that up because funny story with that. There was a guy that he was doing a turn to Fort Lauderdale from Appleton, Wisconsin to Fort Lauderdale and back. That was going to be his flight, but he got sick on the way down. And so I got called and they said, Hey, we have a mid flight sickness crew member. You're going to have to go to Appleton for the night because it was already late. Like I was doing an afternoon call shift, if you will. And so I get to the airport and I get in the cockpit. And of course, these are crews I don't know at all. They're Appleton crews. And so I get in the cockpit and the captain was like, Hey man, my FO knows you. 
And I'm like, he does? Yeah. He was like, yeah. I was like, well, what happened? Because I just have to ask if I'm going to stay the night. And this was actually ahead of the night before the RTAG convention in Dallas-Fort Worth, where I was a redshirt volunteer. I was supposed to be there meeting with my team. I was a concierge team lead, if you will. And I was supposed to be there meeting with my team the day before. But yet I got called out the night before. I'm on shift. I got to go. So I get there and I was like, hey, man, I just got to ask, like, what happened? I'm going to be staying the night way up north. And he was like, oh, yeah, my FO, he, he ate like two pounds of grapes. And then he just threw up. Oh, <laughs> he no. was like, oh, and he says he knows you, too. And I was like, really? It was a fellow classmate of mine, a fellow new hire classmate of mine, and a fellow Army helicopter pilot, our tagger, that did it. He got up to Appleton. He rode in the back, and we got up to Appleton. He was like, hey, Jimmy, thanks, man. I really appreciate it. And I'm like, if I got to sit in someone else's vomit, it may as well have been yours, buddy. Oh, oh, no man. problem. <laughs> So you brought up a couple interesting points. So if you are an Allegiant pilot, you're tied to your base, you're Fort Lauderdale, and Mm -hmm. your crews, the captains that you fly with, they're all based there. So you guys get to know each other pretty well. That And I'm glad you brought that up, Nick, because guess what? So when I'm interviewing people, when I am not asking them about mock tuck or coffin corner and you're going to learn that stuff later and i'm sure you can study that stuff and take a test over it it's really not what i'm looking for what i'm looking for is when when i put you at those bases of course we have 24 bases when i put you at one of those bases you're going to fly with the same people over and over and over again I did a lot of four-day trips at the regional, man, and I can tell you, you can fake it for four days because once you get out of the cockpit, you may never see that guy again. But here, these people know you. They know your family. You don't just get in the cockpit and you say, hey, I'm Jimmy. I'm a former Army helicopter pilot. I was at the regional, and now I'm here, and I'm glad to be here. Like, I have to tell that story over and over again. Now, it becomes even further subdivided because Allegiant goes out typically about three times a day. We go out early in the morning. That's the shift that I bid for is the early, the 5 a.m., the 6 a.m. shows. And those typically get you back at about 11 o'clock in the morning. Then you're done for the day. You know, uh, you're two and a half hours out, 45 minute turn, two and a half hours back. So basically you wouldn't be able to drop your kids off to school, but you'd be able to pick them up for a day like that. Then there's the other shift, which would be nine until about 5 p.m. And so you're home about dinner time. You've dropped your kids off at school. You're home at dinner time. Then there's a later shift, which early afternoon, then you're getting home 10 11 o'clock at night. But what you were alluding to was that you fly with the same people. Well, I fly really with the same people. There's 17 first officers and there's 17 captains in Fort Lauderdale. There's only about four or five that bid early morning. So I fly with the same four or five dudes every time I fly. That's really fun. I think that is a great opportunity to really get to know people and know their life and be present to them. That's pretty fun. You talked about taking the early shift. Are you doing like, are you flying seven days a week? Are you flying five days a week? What does that look like? Nah, not at all. Well, obviously, for you can't go more than six in a row right. with us. So a lot of guys, they're about three days a week, roughly. Okay. And they pick up more what's called a voluntary flying notification. It's an app on your phone and that thing buzzes every day. And when that thing buzzes, if you hit it and you get the trip, You get paid double for that particular trip. And some of them are really good. Like I flew to New York on Monday and I mean, that's a six and a half hour day. So if you're second year FO and you're making $103 an hour, now you're making 206 times six. So go in on your day off and you're making 1,000, 1,500 bucks. Yeah, that's a big score. So the work rules and the ability to adjust your schedule, would you say that is pretty big carrot for Allegiant? I think one of the bigger carrots for Allegiant is going to be the home every night. And this really works for veterans. This is you and I, we fought these wars for 20 years on and off deployment, TDY, everything like that. We're gone, gone and gone. 
veterans, what I found in the veteran community is we want to be home. We want to be home with our families. We did what we had to do. Now we're home and we want to be home. And so I think that is what's most appealing for us. Do you bring a bag as if there's going to be an overnight? <laughs> No, you don't. I don't, man. I don't. So the traditional airline pilot has their big roller and then they have like their headset bag, lunch, whatever. It's kind of hooked to that roller. Well, get rid of the roller and then you have that bag left, but you don't even really need it. In an Airbus, obviously, you don't need a headset. I bring my own in anyway. So what's left? It's an iPad and lunch. So those are the, I have two peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and some cheese sticks that I steal from my kids lunch. And you don't bring MREs with you? (laughs) No, No, but yeah, the bag is a small little, it's tiny. I was at an overnight. I think I tell this on an interview that I've done. I was on this overnight and Allegiant aircraft that had some kind of maintenance issue and the crew was standing outside trying to get a van to a hotel because they were going to have to stay the night, which is a bummer. But the captain have no experience doing that. By the yeah. way. <laughs> and the captain had nothing. He didn't have underpants. He didn't have socks. He's just like, well, I guess I'm going to wear this tonight and sleep in it and all these other things. And that's a great <laughs> problem to have. That is such a good problem because I mean, the being home every night. One of the interesting things you mentioned earlier is you have 24 bases. I'm certainly not going to make you list them all. I know that you know. No, some of them are more common than others. Yeah, absolutely. And so I guess my question is, if I'm a commuter, if I'm not living in a base, like driving distance to it, it seems like it's probably a difficult, a difficult ask to fly for Allegiant. It can be. We do have commuters. It can be. Like, for instance, not necessarily on the first officer side. There's probably a few more captain commuters than there are first officer. Because basically what happens is that a lot of times each base, you're bidding against each other in each base. Not a global bid, but against each other in the base. So a lot of times what happens is that there might be a captain slot that opens up at another base. And so if the person wants to take captain, they might move to another base and then they would commute home until they can hold the base as a captain. That's what we see more often than not on the captain side. First officers don't usually commute. Now, again, you can load up your schedule early in the month and get a crash pad for a week, 10 days or whatever, and just fly every day and be off the rest of the month or however you are able to bid your schedule if you wanted to commute that way. But I would recommend anybody to live in base. Now, I will kind of caveat to that is that right out of training, most people are not assigned their base like right out of training. And I always tell my clients this too, is that I tell them what my story is, is that I was awarded. So we have a month of ground school and that's basically in doc and then two weeks of systems and a few days on the emergency equipment, of the aircraft, and then ground school is kind of over. And that's all takes place in Las Vegas. Then after that, you have kind of the next two segments of that, which are going to be the systems integration trainers, which are those cockpit procedural trainers, not the sim, but close, but you're just demonstrating that you know your profiles, flows, and call outs, and you're studying for your oral at that point. So you get done with sits, you finish your oral, and then you move on to sims, and then you do the sims, and then you get your type rating, and then off you go to IOE. reason I bring that up is that first phase, you do a class bid and you do a systems bid. Those are the two bids that you'll do. The class bid are these bases. They're the Allentown. They're Provo, Utah, Des Moines, Iowa. And I'm sure those are all fine towns. I'm sure they are. I wouldn't want to live there. I live down in South Florida. I'm a Floridian. They're just the junior bases. They're the most junior bases, right? But guess what? People do live there. That is what brought them to Allegiant. They have a base in their backyard. That's why they want to come and work here. So what happens on that class bid, it's in seniority order, and people just pick their bases based on that class bid. But as another new hire class comes two weeks later, 
then that bid just gets passed on to the next class, to the next class. And then it ends up, some of those bases end up sticking to some of those people. We have also the systems bid, which is in the army, we used to call this like a dream sheet, but it actually works better than give me your two overseas spots right. and your one Kona spot. That was the thing. But what you do is you fill this out and that's the systems bid. And once you get locked into your desired base, no one can come and take it from you. So, which is really nice. So by the time I finished ground school, through ground school, I knew I was going to Des Moines, Iowa. Didn't even know how I was going to commute to Palm Beach, Fort Lauderdale. Didn't even know. I'm like, okay, that's the closest thing to there. So by the time I started SIT, that second phase of training, I knew that I had Savannah, which was my number two choice. I retired from the army out of Savannah and I have a son that's a deputy sheriff there. And I was like, okay, at least I'll have a place to stay and while I'm waiting for my base and I'll just commute home on my days off. By the time I started Sims, I knew I had a lock on Fort Lauderdale, but I still had to go to Savannah first. So I had a report date of 1 June of last year of Savannah, and then I had a report date of 1 August in Fort Lauderdale. So when I finished up with IOE, I went right to Savannah, and then I was there six or seven weeks, and then I was in Fort Lauderdale, and I've been here ever since. That's pretty awesome. So you do a lot of the recruiting and also interviews for Allegiant. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about what you are looking for in a kit. Like what would qualify a candidate to be an Allegiant pilot? So what I do is I mainly work with the military community in my recruiting efforts. And by and large, 60 to 80% of our classes are military people. But basically, in order to come to Allegiant, you can come here, skip the regionals. You can come here, absolutely. If you have completed a military flight training program in any branch of service, then you have 750 hours total time, not airplane time, total time. And you have 250 hours fixed wing PIC, 25 hours of multi and airplane instruments. You can come here and then we will send you to ATP CTP in Dallas, Texas. And then once you get your uh, ATP written complete, you roll right into our next new Ohio class. And I will tell you, I just got through talking with one of our guys. He was a zero to hero guy. He was our very in our first ATP CTP class that started on January 9th. He finished it, got his written done. I remember he told me, I sent him congratulations. I think I might've been the one that hired him too. So that class was about 10 days. And then he rolled right into our January 30th class. So he finished IOE yesterday. So my Idaho math tells me that that was 63 days from the time that he started new hire class till the time he's out on the line today. So we move fast. And that is one of the things that I always tell my candidates as well. Like I will move as fast as you can move. I will move that fast. For instance, at a gal that just retired from the Air Force, F-16 pilot, she was, this is last week, my initial contact with her last week. She was in a training program for flight safety. She was going to be a check airman for them, just whatever. But she decided she just really wanted to be in the air. She lives in St. Pete. We have a base there. And she was just like, I just really, I really want to be in the air. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, like I can move as fast as you can move. Our application takes 15 minutes to fill up. 15 minutes. Now, for those of you out there that have filled out any airline application out there at all, you will know that an airline app does not take, it might take 15 minutes to read it. Like, I mean. Yeah. I would say one of my biggest gripes with this entire industry is the amazing amount of time that it takes to fill out an application. It is so miserable. I mean, if you have not done a major airline application, I would say the fastest you could get it done is in seven hours if you had all of the information at hand. Right. I do not dispute that whatever at all. So yes, this gal, she filled out her application. I think it was Friday. We gave her the interview invite on Monday. She interviewed 
today. Got the job, was told she got the job today. So she's going in the April 1st class. I think one of the reasons that uh, one of the things that makes us successful is that there is kind of a and I do not pretend to know everything about the airline industry, but I understand that at least at the regional level, there is kind of a clog in the pipeline. Am I correct, say? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, there's a clog in the pipeline because there's not enough captains. The first, uh, And as people get enough flight time, they're just getting cherry picked by all the other airlines. Yes. Yeah. So we have a lot of people that are available to start training right now. And so we asked them, when can you start? That is one of the questions I asked in the interview. When can you start? And by and large, most of the military people are like, well, what do you got? Okay, well, I've got May 1st. How about that? Can you do that? Yeah. Yeah, I can do that. A lot of people that I've been talking to recently are like, so the other day I was having a beverage at a local watering hole with a friend of mine who is a helicopter pilot who is flying air ambulance on the West Coast. And he's probably got 4,700 hours, but of that only like 450 or fixed wing multi-engine. Is that a person that is that would be amicable to an Allegiant job? Or is there some kind of focus on things that they would need that you would recommend that they go after? No, I'll tell you what, if you gave me that person's phone number, I would call them today. And that's something that I think I and the rest of the talent acquisition team here at Allegiant does pretty well. We reach out to people immediately. You apply with us, you're going to get an immediate text and an email. We got your application. And then if you're not qualified, which a lot of our guys are not, and a lot of the people that I'm hiring today were people that I spoke with in November. And I give everybody, I may have told you in the past that I'm available to any veteran, any art tagger, any pilot, anytime. And I reach out to them immediately. And I tell them, I'm kind of a long-winded person if you can't, haven't figured that out yet. I've gotten it down to about 30 minutes where I can, instead of talking to two people a day, I can talk to like eight now. But yeah, your friend that you're speaking about, that is definitely a person that we would target for sure. Is he a military pilot? Was he, he was an this guy was, army guy? Yeah, this guy was not army, sadly. He's a cool Navy guy like me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the point, I think the point I want to drive home is the reason I brought that up is because we sat down and we had this conversation and he knew surface level information about Allegiant, but he thought in his mind, I know like when I hear his hours and everything else, I know because I talk to you, I talk to all the other people in our industry that do your job and I know what everybody's looking for. But a lot of people, they feel like they don't qualify. They self exclude, self discriminate themselves, whatever the term is. And yeah, self eliminate, self eliminate. Thank you. Yeah. And I would certainly tell that person that's listening that thinks that maybe they don't have a shot, I highly recommend filling out the application and letting them tell you, you had a little sprinkle of something really important. And if somebody is not qualified, that doesn't mean they're totally not qualified. It means not yet. Right. So let's get you to where you need to be. And let's come up with a mm -hmm. roadmap. And what you're already doing is starting that network and starting that conversation. Yes. And what happens when someone is not qualified? We get a lot of guys from the Infinity Flight Group too. And then there's a couple of flight schools in Texas. I don't even know where they are, but a lot of the guys that want the Austin base that we have, and they're going through their flight training, they're using their GI Bill. And then we have a bunch of guys from the South Carolina National Guard, North Carolina National Guard. So we got the Asheville base and Savannah base. So we have these clusters of people that when one person gets it's a job at Allegiant, it will be four or five other people that will contact me like, hey, here's Jimmy's number, like contact him and I will walk them through exactly what they need to do. I can't shortcut anything for you. I can't tell you, well, yeah, you only need 225 hours of PIC and will kind of work. I can't do that because guess what? I had to do all 250 hours of <laughs> fixed wing PIC too. And so did you and so did everybody else out here. Sorry, but we're going to create a roadmap for you and we're going to send you, we're going to at least review your application. Then we're going to send you an email that says, Hey, you know, John, 
you're not quite qualified yet, but just keep working towards it. And when you do, send us, email us back with your updated resume that reflects your hours that say you either meet restricted or ATP minimums. That's all they have to do. So you sit in the room with them and you ask them your questions. And Mm -hmm. can you tell if somebody is prepared? Yes, 100% can. Now, since all of our interviews are virtual, almost all of our interviews are virtual, obviously, we will do in-person interviews at some of the shows that we go to in GPA, our tag, and we're going to the pilot network here in a couple of weeks. But obviously, if we have somebody who's applied and we have their application on file, we will conduct an interview on site there as well. But by and large, we will conduct interviews uh, two to three days a week. And so, and they are virtual. The interview process, it's very relaxed. There's been a couple of people that I was just kind of like, yeah, you're not prepared. Like you're not, but it's probably just wasn't a good fit for them. It really wasn't. But we just asked that you log in on time, you wear a suit, you take notes, you ask your questions because our interviews are Not much different than anybody else's where we have, it's virtual, but what we have is we have a group interview where we tell them about the company. We tell them about our bases and everything they could expect. And then afterwards, all those people break out and then they go to an individual interview where they could interview with myself or two or three other people from our interview team. Which is also virtual? It's also virtual. Okay. And so the mistake I made when I did my interview was that I had the group interview early in the morning and then my second interview way in the afternoon. So I had to kind of like pace around after my one hour for the rest of the day until the I was like the last guy of the day to do the interview. No so, stress whatsoever. No, not at all. So, but yeah, we just asked that you come prepared and if you have questions, please ask them. And we want to be as transparent as possible in whatever questions they have. And then when they're doing their one-on-one, I mean, I can tell by how they're answering the questions, whether they're prepared or not. I start off with real, real softball ones. Are you ready for some of these? Sure. Let's go. Okay. Do you have a passport? Oh. Do you have a restricted or unrestricted ATP? Do you have a first class medical? Do you have at least 250 hours fixed wing PIC? And a lot of the questions are just very, very basic. We just need to, even though on their application, they said they were qualified, we just need to re-ask those questions. And then we'll ask them, hey, we have your resume. And I'll talk about that in just a second, but I'll talk about it right now. Interview prep is important. Yeah. Okay. It is important for every single job out there. That's right. Okay. We have a virtual interview process, but guess what? We have your real resume in front of us. That's right. Okay. So interview prep is important. And I know you run a fantastic interview prep uh, company. Only the best one. Only the best one. But interview prep is absolutely important. At least pay for that good resume. At least. Because it's your resume. I do not know you at all before I interview you. A lot of these people, I do not know them. Now, the military folks, I do, but because I've talked to them on the phone a lot of times. But your resume, that's the only thing that represents you. That's right. And Everything you put on there is true because you say it is. Yeah. And so... I see a lot of bad resumes and goofy stuff here and there. And it's important because it is a testament to who you are and how professional you are. You don't need photos on there. You don't need pictures of other things. You need the data that speaks for yourself that is makes the most sense. And I always tell people if they don't have a resume, my, sorry, shameless plug here at the spitfireleague.com slash podcast, they can just yes. get it, get a free resume, download it and just get it. Just a thing. And it's great. I mean, everybody, it's a pilot. It's my resume for crying out loud. Let's go. Yeah. And Spitfire is fantastic. And I will tell you that Since I look at so many resumes, I look at a lot of them and I'm looking for like three things and I need to find them in a relatively short amount of time. 
Can you tell me what those three things I would be looking for the most? I would be thinking uh, total time, multi-engine time, and an ATP. Those are my three things. Well, pretty close, but flight time, I need to find the flight experience. And you're absolutely right with what's included, subdivided into that. Work history and education. Sure, yes. I need to find it in about three to five seconds. I had one resume and this individual was, if I were to give a like my fourth grader, an assignment to write an essay on what they thought a resume would look like. That's what it looked like. And I mean, I did. I stepped in before his interview, man, and I just helped him out. Like, hey, listen, and this is more of what it should like look like, especially aviation ones. One page, not three. It's tricky too, especially for my military brothers and sisters. It can be tricky because if they've ever applied for a government job, that thing's like 12, 15 pages long. But also if people don't know, they just don't know. And it's up to us. It's up to me. It's up to you. It's up to the other recruiters to help mentor them to make them better because they're probably awesome pilots. They just have not been told. And once you know, you know, and that's an awesome thing. Right. Yeah. It's happened a few times where we've stepped in like, hey, listen, man. I don't know who you're interviewing with. It could be me. It could be somebody else. But look, I'm going to step in and it needs to look kind of like this. Yeah, I'm not going to tell you what to put on there, but one page. My little trick is if they hand me a stapled resume, I will pull the other pages off and put it in the trash can and then look at this one page and I'll say, does this tell me everything I need to know? Because this is all the time I have. (laughs) And I'm not even hiring anybody. I'm just looking. (laughs) Yep. So... All in all, it seems like the Allegiant process is really cool if you are a person that wants to have flexibility to live in a lot of different variety of places because there are so, so many bases for one. Mm -hmm. And two, to be able to be a little bit more of a family unit, be home at the end Mm -hmm. of the day and have a consistency that you can plan on that. Yes. And that seems like, it seems like a really positive and flourishing culture, especially because you get to spend time to get to know the people that you're flying with on a deeper level because you're with them much more often. Yes. You get to know your crews very, very well, very well. And it's a great job for, we have a lot of moms that are pilots. It's a great job. They're not gone from their child for four days. Yeah, They're gone that day. And oftentimes it's somebody else that might pick their child up or drop them off or maybe it's grandma that does that or their husband that does that or whatever. But like it is definitely the place for moms with children and also military people. I can't say it enough. I can't say enough about how many R taggers we have. We're probably going to be, it's my goal by the end of the year that half of each base is full of our taggers, at least half. That's my goal. That's awesome. I love that goal. I think that's a really fun one. And it's a really fascinating opportunity that is being afforded right now. And uh, frankly, three years ago, nobody would have a chance. Four years ago, nobody would have a chance. No, they would not. And we would be, I mean, there would be 1,500, 2,000 jet hours or something like that. But the pilot shortage is what it is. Yep. And as I always say, if you're willing to put in the work, Jimmy's willing to put in the work too. Like I will guide you in whatever I can do. The only thing I can't do, I told one guy that he was short like, 10 flight hours. This is is comical. He was short like 10 flight hours. And he's like, man, I got my CJO from this regional and already with these flight hours. And I was like, okay, when's your start date? And it was like October or something. It's like last month, like October or something like that. I was like, that's a regional in October. Okay. So you're going to take that chance. You're going to take that chance right now and not fly those 10 hours. You could be interviewing with us next week if you just fly those 10 hours. And in fact, I don't even know why you're talking to me right now. You should be in that Cessna. Go fly. You should be in that Cessna flying right now. Why don't you call me when it's done? And that was on a Friday, on Sunday. Hey, Jimmy, I got it done, man. I got it done. All right, good. That's a good news story. And when they contact me, I contact the HR department immediately because I don't want to leave anybody behind. So immediately, 
I text, mass text goes up. And I say mass text, there's only like five or six people that do this. And it goes up to the group. The group pulls it up and then, okay, he's moved on to the next level. And then the next thing you know, the next day, an interview invite comes out. Like that's how fast it is. And that's how how we're able to be competitive. Yeah, it's good to have a tight knit group and it's good to get doing that. I love that that guy's inspiration that he just went out and knocked it out. That's a really good news story. Mm -hmm. Jimmy, I really appreciate you spending your time with us. We'll have your contact information in the show notes. And I know that everybody will be looking for you at TPNX and looking for you at all the conventions. So thank you for spending time. And I really appreciate you being here, my man. Hey, before I let you go, I need to mention one thing because a lot of people are asking me, can you do anything? Can you help me with this? And the answer is yes. At Spitfire Elite, we will make more millionaires this year than Major League Baseball will make in the next five years. Our company actually does this. It's called Spitfire Elite Interview Consulting. And you can find us over at SpitfireElite.com. Our clients, they call us the easy button for interview prep because everything you need to crush your interview is there in one spot. Whether it's application review or interview prep, all of it is covered. We've helped thousands of clients who are now flying at their dream jobs because our coaches gave them the one-on-one feedback that they needed to succeed on the biggest day of their life. The best part of Spitfire is our community. All Spitfire clients will get access to our private chats where they can work with each other and they can work with our coaches and get the latest information on all the airlines. If you'd like to make sure that you are 100% ready to go on your big day, there is only one choice. Everything you need is in one place and I think it's pretty affordable. You'll have to take a look for yourself. Just go over to SpitfireElite.com and check us out. Use the coupon code podcast and it'll save you 10%. And by the way, I will see you on the next episode. The statements made on this show are my own opinions and do not reflect, nor are they under any direction from my employer.